Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. This bill is welcome, as it was a Conservative 2019 manifesto commitment to carry out a fundamental review of the business rate system, the final report for which was published alongside the 2021 autumn budget. Generally, I am supportive of the bill, but I have two concerns. Firstly, the bill should be seen as the start of the process to radically reform business rates and not the end game. The ultimate objective should be to reduce the uniform business rate multiplier to the order of 30p in the pound, to carry out annual revaluations, to abolish the multitude of complicated reliefs and to digitalise the Valuation Office Agency, that's the VOA. If we do this, business rates will be reduced to an affordable level, the system will be put on a long-term, more easily understood footing, and we shall be able to remove barriers that impede regional growth, so-called levelling up. This way, businesses will know where they stand and they will be able to make long-term investment decisions. This is the message that I continually get from the Suffolk Chamber of Commerce, who carry out quarterly, um, quarterly economic surveys in the county, and number one always on the concerns of businesses in Suffolk is business rates. Madam Deputy Speaker, my second worry is that the bill, as drafted, rather than easing the bureaucratic and administrative burden that is placed on businesses, actually increases it. I shall set out my concerns in more detail, but I would urge the Government to introduce amendments to prevent this from happening. Madam Deputy Speaker, before I came to this place, I was a Chartered Surveyor, and whilst I did not specialise in business rates, I did from time to time carry out appeals. Business rates are a tax that does have certain inherent advantages to the Treasury. They yield approximately £25 billion per annum, they are relatively easy to collect, and they are difficult to avoid. That said, if the system is not administered pro properly, business rates do have significant negative impact on businesses generally, on specific sectors, and we've heard of the challenges that hospitality and retail are currently facing, and on local economies. Generally, this is what is happening at present. Business rates are, in effect, a tax on existence rather than profitability, and thus it is important that they are kept as low as possible. High business rates not only discourage occupation, but they also disincentivise investment in innovation, improvements and quick ex and expansion. And Deputy Speaker, just forgive me here, I'll have a quick commercial interlude whilst we're on the issue of innovation to congratulate PCE Automation of Beckles, who've just got the King's Award for Enterprise in recognition of excellence in innovation. Getting back to the main topic of business rates. At the time of high inflation, high utility costs and stubbornly high rents, business rates are a fixed cost that occupiers cannot escape. In the Chancellor's autumn statement, he made some significant announcements which are to be welcomed and which include the revaluation which is now coming, to in, coming into effect, the reform of the transitional relief scheme and the freezing of the uniform business rate, rate multiplier. This bill provides the necessary legislative framework for some of these changes, for others arising out of the government's review, as well as some minor adjustments to legislation and the correction of some anomalies. At this stage, Madam Deputy Speaker, I shall not go through the provisions of the bill in detail, though I'll repeat that I do applaud the Chancellor for the undertakings that he made last November. They were very much needed in these challenging times. However, as I mentioned, the bill must be seen as the start of the process of radical reform and not its conclusion, 
and as I said, there are unintended consequences which it is necessary to guard against. Madam Mr Speaker, I shall now go through these in a bit more detail. Firstly, the Bill, as drafted, adds to the regulatory burden on businesses at a time when we should be looking to ease and reduce it. Justified as necessary by the VOA so as to facilitate the move to free yearly reviews, the new duty to notify, and I'm going to come back to quite a bit, and it's in, in Clause 13 in particular, it will result in a mountain of paperwork for ratepayers. Businesses will now have to notify the VOA of any changes to their property within 60 days or find themselves facing punitive fines or even imprisonment. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is not right that we should expect businesses who are already facing an ex extraordinarily challenging regulatory environment to put up with this. This obligation was previously the VOA's, but it has now been transferred to the ratepayer. The VOA have no corresponding obligation and they are able to respond to requests for information at their leisure. Ideally, Madam Deputy Speaker, this duty to notify should be removed from the Bill in its entirety. However, if the Government wish to impose this new duty, they must do so with the principle of, of reciprocation in mind. The VOA must have a corresponding duty to respond within 60 days, giving the ratepayer rebates on their business rates bills equivalent to the penalties imposed upon them if there is a failure to respond in this time. Madam Deputy Speaker, my second concern relates to Clause 14, which proposes changes to the circumstances that rateable values may be altered outside of the regular cycle of revaluations. I am concerned about the consequences of this clause, and I believe that it should be removed from the Bill. By way of background, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, a material change of circumstances allows ratepayers recourse to pursue relief on their business rates bills when factors outside their control impact their, the ability to, their ability to do business and to operate. To my mind, this is logical, natural justice. But the VOA seem to dislike the paperwork associated with these claims, as evidenced by their mass rejection of 400,000 COVID-related appeals. It thus appears that in order to prevent such a situation repeating itself, it is now proposed to exempt any government legislation as qualifying grounds for a challenge. In practice, this means that the government would be able to act with impunity and enact policies that could hamper businesses without allowing them the legal recourse to challenge them. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is fundamentally unjust. As I've mentioned, the move to free yearly revaluations should not be the end game, but it should be the stepping stone to annual revaluations. The advantages of this approach are that there would no longer be the need for the complex, um, current complex system of reliefs. Businesses would in effect, be paying a tax that moved with the market, and this would lead to greater long-term certainty, which would then encourage private sector investment. At first glance, annual revaluations might seem too complicated and challenging. However, as we've heard, we, they have such a system in the Netherlands, and there is no reason why we should not have such a system here. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is with regret that for many businesses, discussions and negotiations with the VOA are conducted in, accord in accordance with the philosophy of one rule for us, another for them. The proposed duty to notify embeds this sentiment still further. It must be removed and the system must become more transparent. The VOA's processes are notoriously opaque and leave many ratepayers scratching their heads when they receive their revaluation figures. As it stands, a business's only recourse for understanding their rateable value is to go through the VOE's complex check, 
challenge and appeal process, which many feel is deliberately designed to discourage people from, dare I say it, peering behind the curtain. The bill, as currently drafted, does provide the VOA, VOA with the power to give more information to ratepayers, rate but only at their discretion if they consider it reasonable to do so. This provision is set out in Clause 10, but it is vague and undefined, and some might say that it provides the VOA with the ability to reveal information to no one whilst appearing to be forthcoming. If Clause 13, Madam Deputy Speaker, requires businesses to provide reams of information to the VOA, it is only right that they should reciprocate. Ratepayers must be given the option to understand the process that defines the tax that they will be paying for the next three years and to reasonably expect an answer within 60 days of submitting the request, thereby mirroring the duty to notify. My final concern, Madam Deputy Speaker, of another unintended consequence of the duty to notify, as currently drafted in the Bill, this is the wave of predatory, unqualified and unscrupulous rating advisers that I fear that it may spawn. The ramifications of financial advice, whether good or bad, can be huge for individuals and businesses. Most financial advisers in most settings require a licence to give advice from a sanctioning body. And then thus one has to ask, why doesn't this also apply to rating advisers? I will give way. Yes. I'm extremely grateful to him for giving way because he's making an excellent speech. This point about advice, as a financial controller, you are inundated daily with people cold calling you, offering to challenge your rates bill. Um, and you have no idea who they are, and they take a cut of any potential saving that you've got. But it indicates two things for me. One, that the, that the system is not fit for purpose, and secondly, that the actual rating values are inadequate in the first place. And I wonder if you'd agree with that point. I, I thank, thank the Honourable Lady for that intervention. I would agree with her. And actually, when, when I was practising as a charter surveyor, and as I said, it's, I, 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 it's a very, very specialist area of um, valuation. And, but quite often when I did get called in, it was because the client, the business owner, had gone down the line of paying money up front to someone who sent them a circular, and that person, they may have paid them £1,000, £2,000, and then suddenly they've disappeared. And I often got called in to try to sort out that particular type of situation. At the current time, Madam Deputy Speaker, with the publication of the new rating list, thousands of businesses are being flooded with solicitations from charlatan rating advisers who are taking advantage of the confusion created by the complicated rating system. There is a significant risk that many businesses, particularly SMEs, will, who will not have either the understanding nor the capacity to meet the duty to notify, and they will increasingly fall prey to such bad advice. This could have a devastating impact and thus the government should consider some form of licensing so as to protect businesses from the scourge of cowboys who may be looking to take advantage of the new duty to notify. Madam Deputy Speaker, you will be pleased to hear that I have now reached my conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Taking into account that we've been awaiting legislation on the reform of business rates, for the whole of the 13 years that I have been an MP, this legislation is indeed welcome. For too long, we have been carrying out reviews and searching for holy grail solutions that involve the, uh, the ab abolition of business rates, and my own personal view is, frankly, those do not exist. As I have said, the Chancellor should, should, should be commended for the positive announcements that he made in his autumn statements, some of which are included in this bill, which should be viewed, the bill should be viewed as a step in the right direction. However, as currently drafted, the bill does contain a number of false steps that are likely to have unintended consequences. 
It is also vital to recognise, as I've said, that this is not the end of the reform of business rates, but it is the end of the beginning. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to support this bill this afternoon, but it does have defects that do need to be addressed as it progresses through this and the other place, and I do hope the Government take on board the concerns that I've highlighted and that colleagues across the Chamber have also highlighted. Thank you. Uh, Shadow Minister James Murray.